Okay, hello everyone. It's 4 o'clock. Welcome to our webinar. We're going to get started uh, in a minute. I just want to get a chance for everyone to say hello. My name is Allison Little, and I'm the Program Manager here at the Ontario Historical Society. And with me today is uh, our presenter, Jill Collier. Jill, would you say hello? Hi, everybody. Great, that's Jill. And uh, Andrea Itso, also of the Ontario Historical Society, our Communications Coordinator. Say hi, Andrea. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I know a lot of you just finished a very busy day at school, and we very much appreciate you uh, joining us today. All right, so uh, welcome to the Historical Educators webinar. This is the second in a series of professional development and general interest sessions we've developed as part of our Strengthening Ontario's Heritage Network project. Today's webinar is hosted in partnership with the Ontario Elementary Social, Social Studies Teachers Association and will be led by Jill Collier of the Historical Thinking Project. A little bit about the Ontario Historical Society for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, the OHS. This OHS is a non-profit corporation and registered charity, a non-government group founded in 1888, bringing together people of all ages, all walks of life, and all cultural backgrounds interested in preserving some aspect of Ontario's history. And as you can see on the slide here, 2013 marks the 125th anniversary of the OHS and the 100th anniversary of our home in Willowdale, John McKenzie House. This is a big year for us. Um, I think it's also important to state, uh, especially given today's webinar topic, that the OHS, OESTA, and the Historical Thinking Project are nonprofit groups and not part of the Ontario Ministry of Education. The guidance, resources, and advice provided today are not the Ministry's guidelines, but they're intended to give professional support as you interpret the new curriculum documents. So a little bit about why you're getting this webinar today. Uh, the webinar is part of our Strengthening Ontario's Heritage Network project. Now this is a new initiative at the OHS which will, through online activities, connect our members uh, and provide opportunities for interaction amongst heritage groups throughout the province. The project includes the development of an online members portal, an interactive mapping tool showing heritage organizations and sites within our uh, Ontario, heritage, Ontario Historical Society directory, and of course this webinar series, so that's why uh, we've got this series going on today. And this uh, project is funded by the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport. So, um, today's webinar will start really shortly. Jill's presentation will last for about an hour, and then my colleague Andrea and I will speak, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. I just wanted to uh, do a little poll here with everyone to see where we're coming from in the uh, Ontario. So I'm going to uh, send everyone a poll, and you can actually click on it and give me your answer. So let's see where we all are in uh, the province. So you should be seeing a poll now. Please click on your region of choice. Looks like a lot of folks from Greater Toronto Area, which we expected, but there's a good sprinkling around the rest of the province. So everyone finish up your votes and I'll close the poll. So now you can see the poll results. 20% uh, in southwestern Ontario, hello to everyone down there. 17% in central Ontario, 7% in eastern Ontario. 5% up in the north, and 51 in Greater Toronto Area. So welcome, everyone. And we're now going to hide the poll. So thank you for participating. It gives us a good sense of where we are in, uh, in the province. So a little bit about our presenter today. Today's session will be hosted by Jill Collier, National Coordinator of the Historical Thinking Project. Jill has been a teacher and a writer of curriculum material since 1991. As an educator, she has taught both secondary school students and adults. Her secondary school experience has been gained at a number of schools within the Waterloo Region Board of Education in Ontario and at Taylor's College in Malaysia. Her work in adult education includes working with teachers upgrading their qualifications through the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto and working with student teachers from a variety of faculties of education. Jill's work in curriculum development includes the writing of courses, textbooks, teaching guides and assessment tools. Jill's publications include seven secondary school texts for civics, globalization, nationalism, sociology, and history courses in Ontario and Alberta. Her most recent text, Creating Canada, weaves historical thinking concepts and language throughout the historical narrative. Jill has also been a writer and editor for the CBC since 1996. As a writer for the CBC Educational and Current Affairs program, News and Review, she has covered stories ranging from the economic crisis in, in Zimbabwe to gang wars in British Columbia. 
She's also contributed to the series Geologic Journey and the film John A, Birth of a Nation. All right, so I'm going to switch control over to Jill, so just give us a moment while we change views. Okay, great. And if uh, I liked your phrase, giving me control. This will be the first time today I've had any control over anything that I've done, so that's a good, good idea to start this off. Um, welcome, everybody, and I just wanted to echo Andrea's comment earlier about thanking you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, I know what it's like to put a full day in in the classroom and, uh, and then have to still uh, fit in some PD or something at the end of the day, so thank you very much. Um, I wanted to start off with two disclaimers today. Um, one is that my office is in downtown Toronto and it's beautiful out. I have the window open, so if you hear construction and things in the background, that's what those noises are. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, the funny thing about working in a webinar is that we know that in terms of best practice for teaching, we don't want to work in a transmissive model of education, right, where one person is passing over information and someone is passively receiving it. There are some elements of a webinar that are interactive where you can ask questions or there's the chat feature, but obviously, by and large, this is a one-way uh, transmissive um, process that we're going to be involved in. So not best teaching practice, but on the other hand, it is one way to communicate information. We have new curriculum that has uh, recently dropped, and um, you know we need, we need to discuss it and obviously think about our own practice and how it all fits together. So I'd like to think of the webinar as a first step in us going through this process. Um, I'm going to try not to rush. I'm not going to worry about the timeline so much. Um, I'll stay on time or finish early to respect your time but to hopefully I'll cover enough of the information uh, to give you an idea of the key changes in the curriculum, point you in the right direction for next steps and resources, and my um, contact information is on the front of the slide, and it will show up again at the end. And, um, you know, I encourage you to please contact me uh, directly if you have additional questions or if you think I can help in some way. We've been working on curriculum change across the country now for about five years. So there are a lot of resources that I have even just on my computer that are not posted on the website yet. And instead of people trying to reinvent the wheel, um, I just encourage you to get in touch in case there's some way that I can that I can help out. Okay, enough preliminary uh, information. So today I'm going to focus on the key changes in the curriculum. One of them is the introduction of discipline-based thinking concepts, so I'll focus on what discipline-based thinking concepts is, what the Ontario Ministry, um, how the Ontario Ministry has defined that, and then we'll look a little bit about how we can integrate historical thinking into your own classrooms, um, museums, we have a lot of museums educators on the webinar today, or in source materials if you're working within an agency or organization that's producing educational resources. I did quickly look through your preliminary survey information that you submitted to OHS, and I saw that there, there is a chunk of people that are attending the webinar today that are interested in very specific elements of the content of course changes under this curriculum guideline revision. The, I won't be addressing specific content today in, in, in the sense that I'm not going to have a curriculum correlation side by side that shows you how particular events have been dropped and other ones have been added. I would like to direct you to the OESTA website if you are a junior and immediate teacher. I've got the, the website um, up here on the screen, and of course you'll have access to this PowerPoint after the fact. But subject associations um, like, well, organizations like OESTA, OHASTA for secondary school teachers in the province, and your own subject associations will likely do curriculum correlations for you to answer those specific questions about changes in content. I'm going to focus today on the key changes in the curriculum, and there's really only two of them. One is the adoption of an inquiry model of instructional practice, and I'll talk about that very briefly. I'll spend most of my time talking about the integration of discipline-based thinking concepts across the courses. So that'll be the focus for today. I mentioned that the first big change is a real um, push by the Ontario Ministry to have teachers move towards an inquiry process or an inquiry model of instruction in their classrooms. There's nothing new about inquiry. It's basically, instead of phrasing the work that you're doing that day in terms of a topic, 
turning them into engaging questions, having students go off and ga gather and organize information in response to that investigation. They sift, interpret, analyze what they, the information they have. They draw conclusions, and then they're going to communicate their findings in a variety of different ways. So that's very much best teaching practice we tend to sometimes fall back into more of a linear or Socratic method of instructional practice simply because we don't have the resources that are properly leveled to do the kind of inquiry work we'd like to do in a classroom. Um, I've heard the phrase that in this post-information age, you know, trying to get information off the internet is like trying to get a drink from a fire hydrant. I would say that's the, tr that's the truth for our students as well as for teachers. When we want our students to work in an inquiry model and we're searching for information the night before to get our classes up and running, we want them doing different group works and, if, and then we want different perspectives being presented around the topic, uh, we can spend hours and hours and hours uh, surfing and not find anything that's actually appropriately leveled for the grades and the kids that are in our classrooms. So we are, I'm looking forward to, the re, to resources being developed that are going to help us to do that, and I'll talk a little bit about some of those after. Um, the one thing that you're going to hear over and over as the curriculum is implemented and as you receive PD, and hopefully you receive PD at the district and board level, um, although it's hard to get subject-specific PD, is uh, the term disciplinary thinking or discipline-based thinking concepts. I've just um, pulled this out of the guideline, and you'll see the thinking concepts are being applied across subject area. So social studies grades 1 to 6, there are six concepts that are interwoven throughout the content that you'll be teaching. In history and geography, when it splits into different disciplines, there's four in each component. And then at the secondary level, we move into politics, economics, law. Each of them has their own discipline-based thinking concepts. You can see that they're linked. Significance runs across the top. It changes a little bit by discipline. And I'll talk more about the thinking concepts in a minute, but really there, one way to think about them is a lens through which to view content. So in history, instead of us just looking at dates and events, we'll look at those dates and events in terms of how they relate to historical significance. And I have an activity we'll work on in a minute. So social studies teachers who are working at the younger grades, I find, are always incredibly holistic and do so much integration because they have to, the way the, the curriculum is, is set up for them. You are the leaders in differentiation and meeting the needs of all the kids in classrooms. So, and once again, when you look here, you have the six to do while others will be focusing on four. Historical thinking has different connotations in different jurisdictions across the country, but the ministry in Ontario um, sees historical thinking as a way to help students learn how to analyze past events and actors through this lens of historical significance, continuity and change, cause and consequence, and historical perspective taking. The terms might look very familiar to many of you because we often talk about significance. We understand that there's causes and consequences of events, but instead of just talking about them in passing in our courses, the ministry wants us to integrate these thinking concepts in a very explicit manner. It's really about introducing our students to how historians do their work or how ge geographers do their work and inviting the students into that process. So in the case of history then, and this is being sponsored by OHS, and I work for a history education initiative, um, students will be learning in these courses how historians actually make sense of traces of past information. So there's a few basic principles of historical thinking then that underpin the concept that we're going to discuss today. The first basic principle is that history does not equal the past. In other words, history is not the same thing as the past. This might sound very obvious to those of you who have been trained in a certain history program. It certainly was not the case for me. I never had a teacher tell this to me as a student, and I don't think I ever, ha ever had a professor tell me either. But the past is everything that's happened to anyone and everywhere in the world, and history is really the stories that we choose to tell based on that information. So we're selecting out evidence and we construct a story based on selected information. We don't tell everything. 
So again, as a student, I found, or as an adult, when I, when I finally was introduced to that idea, it, it really changed the way I saw history because I thought that when my teachers gave me those textbooks or those large resources in a classroom, that this was somehow um, the true story or a sex story and it was done and it was finished. There was really nothing to debate or to consider or to revisit because it had already happened and everyone agreed on it and it was done. But that's not the case and so we want to shake that up, blow that up and have kids really look at the way we create history based on the past. So that's a long-winded way of getting into the second point, but again, um, the, uh, one of the basic principles of historical thinking is to help students understand how history is constructed. And we do that by working with evidence and the other concepts. Another key principle is for us to help them understand that as our interpretations of evidence change, as we decide what we leave out in the story, the, the history that we tell actually changes. So we may, evidence itself doesn't tell us anything when we first, when evidence is first discovered because of the body of knowledge that people have at the time, they may give one interpretation to evidence and then with time as we learn more, we get distance from an event, evidence can be reinterpreted as we start to piece together other bits of information. So that's what I mean about the fact that History isn't a set or static story that doesn't change. It can always be reinterpreted and it's a really living thing as opposed to something that's, uh, that's fixed. In the new guidelines, the four historical thinking concepts that I mentioned earlier and that you saw in the chart are addressed in the overall expectations. By placing them in the overall expectations, the understanding is that they will be assessed if they weren't in the overall expectations, the concern is that they would be seen as an add-on, like a skill, and that they wouldn't necessarily make it into the work that we do in classrooms. So the expectation is that these will be assessed, so they would be integrated throughout a course. Two of the concepts that we work with in the project, um, the use of primary source evidence and an exploration of the ethical dimensions of history, are also in the guideline, but they're part of the inquiry model of instruction that is the other key change that I mentioned earlier. So they, the ministry has assumed that we can't make any determinations about, we can't think deeply about history at all unless we're working with evidence as opposed to opinion, and that weighing the ethical dimensions of history is something that comes in an evaluative component towards the end of a period of study around particular events. So all six of them are in there, but they're in two different chunks of the curriculum. When we talk about the six concepts, or any discipline talks about their concepts, we can't help but talk about them in isolation, but I did just want to uh, say up front that the concepts are all integrated. You can't really talk about significance without talking about evidence or focusing on evidence. Um, historical significance significance changes over time, so changes a factor in significance, um, perspective taking, you know, what we understand about a time period changes the way we see significance, and all cycles around. In the perfect world, at the end of a course of study, students would be familiar with all of the concepts, but if you're going to be working with concepts for the first time in classrooms or in museums, then you may choose to just introduce one or two concepts and that would be enough for that particular year for you with everything else that you also have to do. So I'm going to look at three of the concepts in a little bit of detail today with some examples and activities and um, that really will be all that we have time for for me to walk you through something and then I'll just mention the other three concepts and we're going to turn it over to looking at other areas um, where you can get lessons, review what other teachers have tried, look at major projects, a lot of things that, have, that are on video for you to work from. Okay, so having said that then, um, historical significance, uh, and oh, I should mention that the posters that I'll be flipping through here are, um, are available through the project. When we give workshops, we distribute the posters. There's a class set of six that are available in English and French. 
and um, we simply work on a cost recovery basis. So if you ordered them yourself through the website, they're five dollars a set plus shipping. Um, so historical significance, the key idea behind it really is this idea of what is worth studying. You know, how do we decide what and whose stories to tell? All of the concepts, I think, seem simple up front, um, but again, that's good. We want to invite students into this process and make them wrestle with some of these questions. As adults, we know that as we tell, if we are telling some people's stories, we are not telling other people's stories. That's just the nature of, of storytelling. We can't tell them all, and no resource can include everyone's history with their from their meaningful perspective. So we use, the, we use one group's story as a jumping off point to allow students to do further investigation of other communities, of other cultures. But historical significance allows them to wrestle with the ideas of whose and what stories we tell. So although we're on a webinar, I wanted to give you an idea of how this concept works. Um, we said that we would use curriculum examples from grades 6 to 8 today. So for this activity, I wanted to talk about grade 7. So you've got a time frame of about 17, 13 to 18, 50 in that course. So I just wanted to ask everyone who is listening <laughs> to actually think about that time period and in your head, um, and send them to Allison in a second, sorry Allison, uh, select the three most significant events in Canadian history during this time period. If you're not a history specialist, that is okay, because your students are not history specialists. So everything that we do today should work with our students, not with us who may have advanced study in history. So take a minute and really think about what three events might be the most significant in Canadian history during that time period. And I'm going to actually be quiet for a minute and let you think about it. Okay, I'm just going to go to my next slide and talk for a minute. And before I talk about sort of a debrief of the activity, um, I'll, we'll hear back from Allison about some of the trends, if there are any trends in your answers. So if you are working with this, um, did you want to jump in, Allison, or are you okay? Uh, sure, I can read you a few of the ones I've been sending in. They're coming in thick and fast now. Big trend is the War of 1812, of course. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, Industrial Revolution, early settlers, first contact with Jacques Cartier, uh, expulsion of Acadians, arrival of the French and British to North America, Battle of the Plains of Abraham, introduction of firearms and alcohol to First Nations in North America, Battle for Quebec French and English, uh, English win. <laughs> um, some of these are Point form, uh, Durham Report, War of 1812, the Treaty of Paris, uh, Seven Years' War, so a very military tone, fur trade, um, let's see, responsible government, First Nations treaty, cl uh, treaty claims, migration of loyalists, colonization, the American Revolution. Definitely military seems to be the big, uh, those are the big defining events that people are turning in. Okay, well this is a group that we've got online that has, you know, huge historical knowledge, which is reflected in that list. Um, oh, and another one that's people, some, if someone's just sent me in is Pontiac's Rebellion uh, and United Empire Loyalists. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks very much, Allison. No problem. Okay, so if, if we're doing this activity in a classroom, um, and there's different ways of working with it depending on the age level, of the students. You know, you often have them start working in pairs or in small groups where they could be, um, you know, they could discuss the events because they don't have the historical background that most of the people that I've just heard that list um, clearly have. So they're going to be working in small groups, then they're going to share their events with each other, and they're going to try to agree on three as a class. Now I've picked three randomly, it could be seven, it could be five. Um, and they'll have quite a debate, you know, trying to convince people um, trying to convince the class that their events are more significant than the other. There's a few things that might come out of the discussion. One of them is that during this debate where they're trying to come up with a, with a, um, a collaborative list, someone's going to say something about, well, what does it really mean when we say significance? And you might even, if you're really lucky, get someone to say, don't we need some sort of list or younger kids won't say criteria, but they'll say, shouldn't we have some kind of list of how to come up with these ideas? And they're trying to figure out what significance is and what that looks like. 
And that's the key point of the exercise. We want them to start to think about content in relation to significance. Now, if someone decides what to put in history textbooks. Someone decides what to put on a website. Someone decides what historical event to make a documentary about and which ones are never covered. I mean, there's tons of history that could be covered, but someone decides if there's a market and all of those other kinds of things. Um, the War of 1812 is an interesting one. It, I'm not surprised it came up because it's on our radar because we're just coming up uh, through the commemoration, the anniversary, the War of 1812, and the government, the federal government, spent millions of dollars uh, commemorating the War of 1812 because they made it a decision that as a nation, this is a significant event, war, uh, in terms of our own development and identity. Now, it also was the 50th anniversary of the Charter, and there was no money spent on any sort of anniversary for the Charter. So the government themselves makes a decision about which events they want to kind of publicly recognize and encourage discussion and debate and deep thinking about and those that they do not. And those are the questions we want um, kids to, to debate as well. Now for the elementary teachers that are listening, um, I should mention that on our website, when this activity was first developed, it's not just open like this where kids are coming up with events or developments or people because they don't have that historical background. So we have a set of um, trading cards. We've made up cards with little key historical events on them and you can print them out off the website. They're in color. It shows a picture. It has a little bit of context about the event. The kids then have these little cards in front of them, and they're reading them, right? And they try to rank them in their group. So that, I think there's eight trading cards, maybe not ten, eight, I think. Um, so we're giving them some content to work with. Even with young kids, we find that they can work with significance very effectively. If you wanted to open up with no parameters like this the way I did, this might work better with younger kids if it came towards the end of your course or your unit because then they would have more content to hinge it on. But I often start this way with uh, secondary students. And of course they don't actually know that much about history either. Um, for each of the concepts that uh, we work on in history, there are criteria that have been developed as a measure, as a way to measure whether or not the, the, um, the concept is understood. So in the case of historical significance, we look at whether or not the event, the person, or the development resulted in change, um, meaning that there's deep co consequences over a long period of time for a great number of people. The other criteria, which is quite different than the first, is whether or not the event, the development, or the person is revealing, whether it sheds some light on emerging issues today. This is a key one because there are a lot of events that in some ways haven't affected huge amounts of people, but they are such a tipping point or a turning point, so significant in terms of what it reveals to, about human nature and about development, political choices, you can choose any of your categories, that it's something that we believe it's worth sharing because there's a message or learning that we can take forward. So those two criteria really can help us to sort a lot of content. Um, I'm just going to check my next slide for a second. Um, okay, just one other comment about significance before, before I go on. Um, one thing that, that we do say when we're working with discipline-based thinking concepts, whether it's history, geography, politics, in social studies there's going to be a combination of history and geography. Um, I, I want up front to say, and we work with teachers, we say that it does take more time to work with thinking concepts because if we're going to have these discussions and have these debates, you know, we're not just cramming through content. So we have to free ourselves from that content trap of trying to cover every expectation. Now to the ministry's credit, they have spent some time in the front matter of the new guideline saying that the specific expectations are designed to be examples of things that we can do, not that we have to do them all. But we all know as teachers often those lists of suggestions get turned into sort of checklists that we may have pressure from department heads or administrators um, to kind of go through and make sure we've covered them all off. So I just wanted to flag for you that we keep saying over and over again that we need to do more with less. So cover less content 
because kids are still going to understand the big ideas, but dig down more deeply and do this kind of thinking work around them. Jill, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I could just jump in for a second, because as you're talking about this, I thought maybe a, a great activity would be why not have students at the end of a unit, and uh, this could be a, some sort of an assessment of the learning, uh, give them that time frame, give them a fake parliamentary budget, and allow them to select a political party and maybe explain to them the different uh, ends of the political spectrum and say, um, you choose how you're going to spend this money to commemorate the events that we discussed in the, in the past unit and tell me how much money you would allocate to each event and why. Yeah, absolutely. That would be, it's a great activity. There's activities uh, similar to that around if you were writing a textbook or a resource for a classroom, you know, how would, you know, based on the events in this unit, how would you rank them? What would you make sure would have to be included? What would you be willing to have left out of this of this resource for you know a younger brother and sister to come along and maybe what they don't have to learn so all of those determinations uh, definitely different ways that kids it's accessible for kids to work with um, when we work with this concept in the classroom and again it's a little bit tricky today because we have educators from K to 12 um, participating in the webinar but younger kids um, well, often secondary kids as well, I'll start this way, but I do often start with personal significance as a concept first and asking kids, you know, what are the three most significant events in their own life? You know, they all, any kid at any age can start at that point. And then I make a transition later on when we're looking at historical information and talk about historical significance. I make parallels towards the work we've done with personal significance. And certainly with younger kids, if we're looking at events or people, of local significance, that's something that they can um, manage as well. Um, and most of our elementary um, courses have strands on local communities. So that's a way to start working with the concept without having to you know, work from the poster or launch with criteria, which might be intimidating. You know, I often, in second, intermediate and secondary classes, I will often tell my students how they're going to be assessed. And it could, I could tell them for a particular unit that this unit is going to be assessed based on the significance uh, criteria. So I'm going to be asking them to pick three events that they think are the most important from the unit, and that's going to be their assessment at the end of the unit. And so they know that. And as we go through the unit, they kind of filter out information. They build their arguments as to why some events are more important than the others. So again, they feel like they're part of the process. Assessment isn't hidden from them. They're excited because they feel they can succeed. And what are they learning? They're learning some content, but they're learning how to build an argument based on evidence, which is the critical thinking skills that we want them to take forward. They're drowning in information. That's not going to change because of the internet. If anything, they're going to just continue to be drowned further and further. So we need a way to help them to filter information and make these determinations around critical thinking. Um, jumped around a little bit. I have touched on evidence as we've as we've gone through. Um, really, the key things in the work that we do is focusing on the quality of evidence. And again, this relates to internet research because there is much on the internet that is not quality of evi quality evidence. Um, kids need, of course, all of our language arts teachers and English teachers have always done this. Uh, conflicting evidence, looking at various points of view as well as various interpretations of the same evidence. So these are all the key questions we want kids to work with when they're working with evidence, not to just receive it as a flat source. We want them to challenge it. Um, a key big idea around evidence is that we work with, with students um, is that when, they, when we say to kids, when you think you know something, ask yourself what evidence you have, what you might have overlooked or what you could have misinterpreted. And the reason for that is, again, as I mentioned earlier, because history is constructed from evidence that's left behind, we have to continue to reevaluate and rethink that evidence because it doesn't stay the same. It does change. I have a, um, I wanted to show you an example of this relates to the work that we do. Um, the logo for our project is Champlain's Astrolabe, which is that little round thing um, on the left of your screen. 
So I want to think about why did we choose an artifact like that for our logo, and really the, the, one of the key reasons is because evidence is so powerful. Now I have a very short clip from CBC Archives that I would like to use. I, I watched it so it should load. This is a news clip with Peter Mansbridge talking about Champlain's astrolabe and how it was just discovered and brought back to Canada recently from America. So it's a bit of a primary source piece itself because when you see Peter Mansbridge's hair, you'll know that he doesn't look at all like that today, although who still looks the same. See, it's this. Well, Canada's Museum of Civilization will be officially open tomorrow. The museum is in Hull, Quebec. It will have more than 3,000 displays illustrating our rich heritage. One of the museum's latest acquisitions is a 386-year-old artifact. It's an important piece of Canada's history, but as Julie Van Dusen explains, it's also got an interesting history of its own. There's a lot of fuss and excitement at the new Museum of Civilization about a round hunk of metal. Well, it may not look like much, but to Canada's famous explorer, Samuel de Champlain, it was everything. It's called an astrolabe, a vital navigational instrument used by mariners until the 18th century. From his perch over the Ottawa River, Champlain overlooks his astrolabe's new home, the Museum of Civilization. The $257 million building stands on the exact spot where Champlain camped when he explored the Ottawa River in 1613. Champlain's astrolabe has just been returned to Canada. Shortly after he stopped here, he lost the instrument while portaging near the town of Cobden, about 160 kilometers northwest of Ottawa. More than 200 years later, in 1867, Edward Lee, a 10-year-old farm boy at the time, found the astrolabe under a log near this spot in Cobden. The astrolabe eventually ended up at this museum in New York, and after many years of lobbying by the citizens of Cobden, where it's a big part of local folklore, the federal government bought it from the American Museum for $250,000. It's now one of the new museum's most treasured possessions. Have you got a spot picked out for it? Indeed we have, uh, right over the front door, and probably within about 500 paces of where Champlain used the Astrolab uh, on the 5th of July, 1613, just a few days before he lost it somewhere near Cobden, Ontario. It took nearly four centuries, but Champlain and his Astrolabe are finally reunited. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Hull. Okay, so obviously this is considered by the government to be a big piece of our national heritage. It's an artifact that they wanted back at the Museum of Civ. They paid money for it. They brought it back. That kind of physical evidence is very powerful. Champlain statue there uh, behind Parliament Hill. Um, the reason that that we use that is that you know stories can be false, evidence can be misinterpreted, or just these myths can be created about history that aren't actually based on evidence. So it turns out there is no conclusive evidence that that astrolabe is actually Champlain's. There are dates to the time period that can time, sorry, that can, um, they've t date done testing on the astrolabe and they know that it links to the time period of it, his exploration, but there's no actual record of it in his logs. And some of the recent reports that have been um, written about it say that, you know, when we find these objects, there is always this tendency for us to want to assign objects and artifacts to famous people that, that we consider to be important. But it could have been anyone who passed through the area at the time. And, um, and Champlain was a real um, avid record keeper. They have the logs at the Museum of Civ as well. And uh, I don't believe there's any record in his own writings about that astrolabe. So it's an important um, piece to use with kids. We use it as part of our logo because this is the crux of the work that we do. We want people to really, when they think they know something, how do they know it? And is there any other interpretation that could be valid or piece that has been left out? Because again, we choose what and whose stories to tell based on evidence. We've tended not to tell indigenous people's stories because they have an oral history rather than a physical history or a print record that can be studied. And we now know that that's something that has been um, a disservice not only to the groups, but as a country, we're, we haven't included the voices of all of those founding peoples that we should. Um, 
they, I should just as one other piece on that astrolabe, was they actually, the government um, made a replica of the astrolabe and it went up into space with Julie Payette as a symbol of, you know, Canada's continued to be leaders in, in exploration. So it really has become part of our heritage, although it may not represent what they think it does. Um, one very short classroom activity I just wanted to share with you, and I've, I've changed it from about eight steps just to three steps for today. Um, when I'm working with kids and I want to introduce them to this concept of evidence and how it links to the work that historians do, I have them record everything they've done since they woke up that morning. So I was going to have you do this, um, but we won't have time. I'll just keep moving through it. So in this case, it's the end of the day. So I said this morning, if it was early in the morning, you'd say the last 24-hour period. And they just do point form notes. They make quite a detailed list when you give them time to do it. I then asked them to place a check mark beside any of those items for which there would be some sort of physical trace. Secondary students, intermediate students want to say, are you talking about forensic traces? But it's, you know, we're not talking about that kind of CSI approach to studying things. We're talking about whether there would be a physical record. So if they sent emails, there would be a record. If someone saw them from home from school, there'd be a record, those types of things. So they put a check mark beside all of those where there'd be a physical trace. Many will not have a physical trace. And then they circle the check mark ones, so the traces that they believe will remain for some period of time. So there's going to be some permanent record, they believe, of some of their traces for the day. So that will take them, you know, kind of 15 minutes to work through something like that. To debrief, of course, is always the key piece. So then when they look at their list of the circled ones, which might only be a handful or three or four, if a historian studied the traces, of their life, what conclusions might they make about the student uh, that has those traces in front of them? Is this an accurate representation of that student based on the traces that are physical and that will remain? So we can ask kids what's been left out, what does what we leave out do to the historical record, how might the historian's conclusions change if he or she studied the student's traces over a longer period of time? probably give quite a different picture. Or if the historian studied other people's traces as well. So if they studied all of the, the students in the class's traces, that would give them a very different picture than looking at an individual's traces. And then we can build up for their other grade levels in the school, local community, is that representative of human population at that time? You know, you can go as far as you want with it in terms of scaffolding. Um, this exercise is, is adapted from a book called The Big Six, which is um, a PD resource on historical thinking, written by Peter Satius and Tom Morton, and published by Nelson. And it's, uh, there's a link to it on our website and in the resources sheet that we will be distributing later. So again, that activity um, is designed to make the kids just think about the fact that evidence is problematic. Um, I don't like the word truth. Um, kids often do, well it's here so it's true, because again, evidence is interpreted by humans and therefore it's always open for misinterpretation. Um, it's about 10 to 5. Uh, I think I have a chance just to talk about this one and then I'm going to jump to the resources. Uh, one of the other concepts we work with is historical perspective taking. And I just wanted to comment on this one because most good teachers already do lots of work around multiple perspective taking. We know that when we explore an issue, we want to hear from many voices because one voice is not representative of, of everyone during a particular event. Historical perspective taking is a little bit different because it really asks us to, when we're studying the past, look at the social, political, and economic conditions that existed at the time that an event happened. The key with this is for us to study the past without judging the past by today's standards. And that's very hard because we are a product of the culture that we live in, the family values, the religious values that surround us, our ethnicity, all of the things um, come into play when we look at events. When we're looking at history, we don't want kids to have you know, an instant reaction where they say, ooh, because something is different than, than what is going on today. So when I first work with this concept in classrooms, I actually just work from the poster itself. And all of them are designed to be teaching tools that way and anchor charts. 
And I start with the basic five W's, you know, who's in the picture, when might this be, what are, what's going on, you know, why are they dressed this way. We start to have that, that's the way we first get into the poster. They have lots of ideas. Most of them don't know a lot about the Victorian period. Um, eventually something will come up around, you know, well, they look very different, they're, they're dressed very formally, their hair is very formal, they have these formal gowns. So I talk a little bit about images of beauty, how that changes over time, but also across cultures. Uh, so you can take a slice today and there'd be many different images of beauty in different cultures around the world. So with this Victorian period, you know, finally they say something about this small waist that they're viewing, and then I use that to launch into a discussion about corsets and how, yes, the, your worth as a woman increased by how, s was measured against how small your waist was, and for women that had the highest value and could be married off to the wealthiest men, they would have the very smallest waist. And the only way that could be achieved was through plastic surgery. These women would have had their lower, the two lower ribs removed surgically. Usually when I, when I discuss that with the kids, um, someone will, you know, they all say, oh, oh my God, that's horrible. And someone will say, who would ever mutilate themselves for beauty? And then there's a pause in the class, and then everyone starts to laugh, and they talk about tattoos and piercings and highlights and high heels and gels, and they go on and on about all of the things that, that of course, they do to... Um, to make themselves more beautiful, more appealing, uh, males and females. So I, I've never, I guess I've never really failed to have a really good response to this poster with students when I work with it in this way. And then I use it for the rest of the um, course that any time you start to study something that is different and I get one of those responses, those reactionary, you know, those kind of knee-jerk responses of, oh, oh my goodness, that's crazy, why did they think that way? I always point to the poster and say, remember, you know, we need to know more about this before we can start to understand it. So you need to withhold your judgment and let's, you know, let's do some further exploration first um, so that they don't have their minds made up. So in this case, I work directly from the poster to launch this concept. All right, so um, just wanted you to know that uh, the last three are continuity and change, which looks at the similarities and differences in the lives and conditions of societies that came before us. So we use this concept often once we've taught a couple of units or time periods in history, and we can start to make these linkages between them. Cause and consequence, this is very obvious for us as adults, but nothing happens overnight because of just one cause, but it's exposing that idea to the kids that events have multiple causes that build up until there's a tipping point or a turning point, and events as well have multiple consequences, both intended and unintended. So we can make a great decision, governments can pass legislation based on evidence and um, thinking that the policy will result in a specific consequence. It may or may not, because for every one intended consequence, there could be two unintended consequences which we can't control. So another way to analyze content in a conceptual way. And the last concept we work with is the ethical dimension of history, which really looks at, you know, what do historical injustices and sacrifices mean for us today? Uh, it's impossible to look at history and neutralize events. Um, resources, student resources have gotten much better, but we used to tell, tell it in a very monotone kind of voice and we'd strip out all of the drama and the tragedy, which really is, um, is crazy. You know, you can't talk about in this picture the internment of Japanese Canadians without um, getting emotional and you could pick any other event in, in, in our courses to do the same thing. So it's allowing kids to weigh the ethical dimensions um, that come up throughout studying history. I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the things that are out there for you. I mentioned the PD resource, the Big Six, um, which is um, my director's book, Peter Satius and Tom Morton. There's also an older, smaller book by the Critical Thinking Consortium called Teaching About Historical Thinking that could get you started as well. On our project website, we have about 75 lessons that have been written by teachers uh, directly as they directly relate to the concept. So if you want to get started with significance or cause and consequence, you can search by the concept and you can search by grade level and you will have some examples come up. We also have a blog now on the website 
um, we had a lot of feedback from people that said lessons are in some ways too restrictive and they wanted just more of a narrative piece. So we have five teachers across the country that are blogging on their experiences of introducing a concept, what they wanted to do, how it worked in class, and what they would do differently. And there's other websites here as well where you can access specific lessons. Again, I won't have a chance to go through how teachers have approached all of this. Some have decided to recreate their courses and some are going very, very slow and in integrating one concept at a time, either in a unit or a topic or one or two concepts for an entire course. There's no right or wrong way to do it. There is going to be pressure, of course, for people to get on this and make these changes, but we already do great work and we have a lot of other initiatives as well to respond to um, in our classrooms. So you can only do what you can only do. And if, and if you just get a chance to get started, that's a, great, that's a great way to work through it and then you can figure out what else to apply and what other concepts to jump into. Some people are choosing just to do one project during their grade three, grade four, grade six, grade 10 course. And so they only teach the concepts when they're doing the project and they like to have it packaged that way. They find that easier than trying to integrate it into their daily lessons. There is an example of a project that does this that won the Governor General's Award last year. And so I have the link. There's a video, you go in, you see the two educators talk about the project, how they designed it, and then there's information about how you could do a similar project. There's links to Canadian identity and students' personal family history where it fits into that Canadian narrative. It's excellent. I also have an example here of a teacher who has integrated all concepts throughout her course. She takes the approach that kids are actually doing history in her course and she won the Governor General's Award for her work as a her body of work. So that is here for you to link to. And at least two teachers that are doing excellent work um, across the board had decided they would do this backwards design because that's the way they, they do their own course planning. So they created a summative assessment that includes all six concepts and then they basically uh, charted their or plotted their course outline based on that summative piece to make sure they would get there. So um, Rachel Collishaw in Ottawa, her site is public and all of her files are accessible. We have Ian's uh, materials on our website. Everything is in Word document forms that can be modified for your own students. And Ian also wrote a two-page you know, instructional piece for teachers about how he works through it and how he times it and uses those study days at the end of the semester to work with this model. Okay, so just to conclude then, um, I did mention earlier, because I didn't want to forget it or run out of time, that when we're working with these discipline-based thinking concepts, it is true that we have to do more with less. That's not a bad thing, because there's a lot of things in our courses that really we need to question why we're teaching them from a content perspective. Is it really something that is life or death, death if kids don't, work, don't um, learn it? And the answer is probably no. And for things that are you know, that we consider to be really key elements, spending a little more time and giving kids a more meaningful understanding about those events will leave them as, will prepare them to be better thinkers than us just rushing to cover content, which we face a lot of pressure to do that. It's not our own fault. We have to report, we have pressures from administrators, um, and if we're team teaching, we often have to keep up with others. So it's not that we're bad teachers by doing that, but we would like to see you know, the shift um, in the province where we can have a bit of a breather and get off that treadmill of content. Um, so at the very least, if there are content blocks, if you're, if you're preparing with other partners, think about some blocks that you can cut and then it frees you up to spend more time on the ones you love. To conclude, should you be worried about the new curriculum in Ontario? Absolutely not. Um, first and foremost, you're already doing great things in your courses and in your museums. Uh, you already know that. You look around in your classroom and you know what's working and what's not. Capitalize on what's working. Your, your, you know, our goal is to teach kids. Our, our job is not to teach curriculum, it's to teach kids. So keep doing what you love, what you know is successful. And see this as an opportunity. Curriculum change at least is an opportunity that if you're working with someone who's resistant to change, this gives you an excuse to stop and say, okay, now that there's a new curriculum out, let's take a look at this again. And again, think of what you can cut out and, uh, and what you can do more deeply so that you can really create great thinkers. 
um, here's my contact information again. I was serious when I said, please get in touch with me. We've been collecting for five years now materials across the country, and um, I may well have something that's not been loaded on the website that can help you get started in your own classroom. A lot of work from museums educators that we don't have posted yet, and with archivists and librarians as well. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thanks, Jill. Fantastic, and we're uh, keeping to our schedule pretty well. Uh, so I'm just going to take back control, and uh, my colleague and I will be speaking just a little bit, and then we'll have time for questions, because I do have some questions that have come through during the presentation to send to you. Uh, in order to keep improving our webinar series, we want to hear from you. Um, You'll be receiving an email with a survey and all the resources. So I know everyone's been very keen asking uh, where the PowerPoint slides will be available and when they'll be able to download them. All that information will be sent to you following the webinar. Uh, this webinar series is going to cover a huge variety of topics. And our next planned session is uh, all about guiding heritage workers and volunteers using social media and online resources to teach and reach audiences. It'll be in early December. Uh, but due to the overwhelming response we had for this Historical Educators webinar, we're planning to offer more sessions for those teaching history in the classroom and beyond. So please let us know what ses sessions you'd like to see, and watch for details of upcoming Historical Educators webinars. You can email me directly, a little at ontariohistoricalsociety.ca, and I'll have contact information up at the end with our Twitter and our emails. Um, there's lots of ways to get in touch with the OHS, OESTA, and the Historical Thinking Project. Uh, thank you, Allison, and thank you, Jill. Um, it's going to be hard to follow that act, but I'll just very briefly try and go over some of the resources and uh, ideas that we have here at the Ontario Historical Society that may help you in integrate some of these new uh, historical thinking concepts into your classroom. So here we are on the OHS website, which is just ontariohistoricalsociety.ca. Um, and I'm just going to select uh, the four teachers page. Uh, just as a note, all of this is going to be in your uh, resource package that will be emailed to you after the survey is complete, um, so you don't have to try and scribble down notes. It'll all be in the package. The four teachers page is updated with uh, different ideas and resources that we have produced for teachers uh, specifically in Ontario. The first one um, that I want to talk about today is the Ontario Heritage Directory. Uh, the, it's a database of over 1,600 contacts that will help connect your classroom to its local history. So this resource is free, is free to use and it can help you and your students connect with uh, your local history. It has um, contacts ranging from museums to historical societies to different First Nations that are in your area, municipal heritage committees archives, and you know the whole heritage gamut. Um, I have included in the resource kit a number of activities that you can use uh, in the classroom with the Ontario Heritage Directory. I'm just going to give uh, one or two quick examples. Um, so for example, in grade three, uh, one of the overall expectations that you're asked to implement is to compare life between 19th century and present day Canada and formulate questions and construct thematic maps. So hopefully something like uh, the Heritage Directory will allow you to do something of this nature in the classroom. Um, so we have uh, many participants today from the Peel, Waterloo, and Brant counties. Uh, so I'm just going to scroll down to Brant County uh, down in southwestern Ontario, Brant County. And you'll see an, uh, 25 different entries for this county alone. Uh, you've got First Nations, historic sites, museums, historical societies, etc. cetera. Uh, one of the examples I wanted to pull out was the Bell Homestead National Historic Site. So this is the heritage home of the father of Alexander Graham Bell, uh, who also, by the way, happened to be a teacher. And uh, it goes into different histories about, um, you know, Alexander Graham Bell and the technology that he invented. Uh, has a lot of different science um, programming as well, so you can do a lot of different cross-curricular connections at that particular site. But to speak a little bit to what Jill was saying about historical significance and uh, the quality of evidence, I, I think when we, ha when we have field trips, um, 
and we take our students to these local history sites, a lot of times we get very bogged down with the incidental details of the day, like getting the bus there and having lunch and all that sort of thing. We forget to uh, remember the important questions like why we are visiting this site, what kind of artifacts are being commemorated here, uh, why is that artifact being commemorated, and having these discussions with students uh, can help with their critical thinking skills. Another um, great question to, to, talk, to discuss in the classroom after you've gone back is, you know, who funds these museums? Is it the municipal government, the provincial government? Uh, why does the government choose to fund such a museum and what is it commemorating? Also in that area uh, nearby on the Six Nations uh, Reserve is the Chiefswood National Historic Site in Oshwekin. And that is a similar sort of house. Uh, it's a heritage home that commemorates a different history, a First Nations history in the area and literature. So perhaps having a day where you can visit both sites and have students compare and contrast what's being commemorated and how it's being commemorated. All of this um, you know, feeds into the, uh, the curriculum expectation of, of developing our students as citizenship. Uh, citizens, sorry, and citizenship and, and, and uh, education. The second uh, example I wanted to talk to about was uh, the Rebellion of 1837. So, for example, you could visit Sharon Temple in Newmarket, uh, which is a symbol of peace and harmony uh, built by the Quakers, who are uh, traditionally seen as very peaceful and uh, pacifist uh, people in, th in that religion. Then you could visit uh, a conflicting site that sort of discusses the same topic like uh, Gibson House in Toronto or Mackenzie House uh, that discuss and commemorate the more violent and political side of the rebellion and have students discuss uh, the differences there. Talk, uh, one of the interests, we, we, we recently had a speaker uh, for an event here and he talked about how, you know, despite this uh, long-standing uh, perception that the Quakers were you know, very peaceful and, and uh, pacifistic uh, people. Um, they were actually very uh, strongly involved in the rebellion and uh, that can lead into a lot of different discussions about you know, taking action uh, for social justice or uh, how our organized religions um, conceived by the media today in a post 9-11 world. Uh, this is something that you can do to try and help make uh, history come alive for students and it's not just about people in the past but also um, processes that are still going on to this day. The second um, resource I wanted to point your attention to is the Reading and Remembrance website. So if we scroll down here, uh, we've got the Reading and Remembrance program. Uh, we've been offering this program for a number of years. And uh, I'll just show you the website briefly. Here you've got hundreds of resources, uh, lessons that you can uh, print off and have students read uh, across a number of different themes, uh, such as you know, War of 1812, anti-racism and Holocaust, Flanders Fields, etc. One of my favorite is the birds and animals uh, lesson, which talks about the roles played by uh, animals during the world wars. So all of that content is free to download uh, at the Reading and Remembrance website. There's also, uh, if you select minutes at the very top of the page, there's also a number of thematic minutes that uh, basically are just brief snippets that you can download and use either uh, in other subjects or in your history class. And the goal of the project, obviously, is to in increase historical awareness and, and start um, giving starting points for historical discussion, but it's also a literacy-based program as well. So you can integrate your literacy program with your social studies and history. Uh, we do ask uh, that teachers using the website register by just using the register link at the very top entering your contact information before downloading any of the PDFs. All of the PDFs are for free and are always posted year-round. Uh, it's a great website to visit as we get closer and closer to Remembrance Day and Remembrance Week.
So All I'll right. pass the mic on to Allison. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andrea. So I'll take control back. And we are getting to the questions, folks. I know that uh, everyone's at the end of their day and they want to uh, head home. But uh, the OHS has a lot of resources that we really feel you guys can benefit from. Uh, one of the things Andrea mentioned was OH. It's actually Ontario History, our scholarly journal. So if you're a member of the Ontario Historical Society, you're able to subscribe to OH and get access to all kinds of articles about subjects across the province. And from 100 years' worth of writers, um, there's much to be seen there and gleaned and it's a great resource for research and for teaching students how to use primary sources and secondary sources and doing historical research so um, please get in touch with us if you're interested in learning more about Ontario history our scholarly journal um, one more thing I wanted to mention the webinar you participated in today it was free of charge and we're hoping to attract all kinds of different people from across the province professionals and individuals with a personal interest teachers both classroom and museum um, the Strengthening Ontario's Heritage Network webinar series will offer both free and paid access sessions so that we can continue to provide access to learning all year round. Another slide here, and then I think we can get to questions with Jill. Let me just uh, minimize here. So Jill, I've got questions actually written out that I can just read to you. One of the things people right off the bat were asking me, um, were sending questions rather, were um, whether there are resources available in French. A lot of folks were asking about French language resources and whether the links you shared were available in French. Okay, uh, good question. Um, our own resources, the posters are available in French. The book, The Big Six, which is sort of the, the PD book the, um, that really gives you a detailed exploration of how to work with historical thinking concepts, is now available in French. It was just translated. So both of those links are on our website and in the handout that Allison and Andrea will be sending out. Um, and then, you know, some of the agencies that, that we've indicated on the, on the website, because they're federally funded, they will have material that is bilingual as well. I know it's an ongoing problem to get French resources. We have six ex what we call exemplary lessons on our website, one for each of the concepts, and those we've paid to have translated. But uh, in a perfect world, we'll have French teachers developing their own resources. And if anyone's interested in doing that in collaboration with us, again, that's another reason to email me. Um, we have, uh, we would want to actively get French teachers to develop more resources. Great. And I should also mention as well, um, a lot of the reading and remembrance uh, materials uh, are available in French. Some are and some aren't, so it's just hit and miss. Um, there are some French lessons there as well. Perfect. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks, Jill. Uh, another question we received says, Jill, as a first-time grade 8 history teacher, how do I avoid the content trap with other co-teachers when my class has students with IEPs and HSP des designations? We may get to Confederation, but I don't know about World War I. I am torn between depth and breadth. Suggestions? <laughs> Great question. Um, I would say definitely depth. Um, the, all of the research on, on learning really indicates that if, if we are going for breadth, if we're trying to cover more, you know, we feel there's a sense for teachers that we have, we have done better because we have covered more. But if we have given it a surface treatment, our students who are not great learners uh, certainly are not going to retain it. Even strong academic kids who can take in information orally which is the way we were as, as kids, right? That's why we went on to be teachers. They only retain that information for about three weeks after a test or an assignment unless they're actively working with it. So I would say absolutely go with depth and know that you're giving them a really deep, insightful view of whatever the event or development is that you're studying, and that will take them further than trying to rush through that content. Great. Uh, next question, how can we have rich conversation and discussion about topics if we minimize content? Students won't have the knowledge or context to support their ideas. Yeah, well, I think when we rush to cover content, we don't have those rich discussions because they don't have the context. So that's exactly what we're saying is drill down, dig down. If we're going to really explore historical events, we need to know the social, political, and economic conditions that are occurring at a time. So that takes time to teach all that and provide that context piece. Mm -hmm. So we have to, I think we just have to, again, allow ourselves to explore that, spend the time in class. They're all going to become experts on whatever the content is that you choose to focus on. So it's not that we're not using content, but you're, 
making more of a deliberate choice about which content you're going to cover because you're going to cover it more deeply, which will enable those rich conversations. Mm -hmm. And speaking of rich conversations, we had a few people ask about pulling materials and lessons from other subjects into their social studies, uh, geography and history lessons. And this one in particular stood out to me. Uh, how does archaeology fit into historical thinking and history education? But this could be applied to any other kind of outside topic or outside subject, rather. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. And, you know, archaeology fits because the work that archaeologists do with physical evidence all of that is the same application about the general evidence rules that we discussed in the webinar. And if you're looking at geography, you know, the way they work with physical geography, um, other subjects work with data, and, in, you know, the, everyone has their source of evidence that they use. I know that at the, um, at the earlier grades, you know, there's very little time for any specifically pure history, so definitely those connections have to be made across disciplines. Right, and that actually feeds perfectly into the next question I was going to ask. As you mentioned, Jill, we do have a lot of teachers from K grades K to 12 in this session. So um, I mentioned briefly we are going to offer some uh, historical educator webinars in the future, especially in the upper grades because that curriculum is yet to be released uh, and has just been released. Um, but this question comes from a much younger grade teacher. Um, how do you implement the historical thinking approach at the grade one level? And this is, comes from a French teacher stuck with grade one plan time social studies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not going to, to do historical thinking the way the concepts were delivered today. So that chart at the beginning that looked at the social studies concepts, there's stuff about interrelationships and patterns and trends. Those are the thinking concepts that have been integrated into grades one to six curriculum. So you'll be able to focus on those more general topics that don't have those same historical tones to them. So if there's a content area that you know someone is, is going to be developing, you can look at how the concepts could be used, how any of those six concepts um, from one to six could be used and layered onto that content. Great. And uh, our final question, because we are going to wrap up, is someone has asked, do you think a new textbook will be published soon for grade seven and eight as a result of the new curriculum? Yes, I know that all of the um, major educational publishers have materials in development. I should say we've been pushing all of them to not just develop um, textbooks alone because I think in our classrooms we need to be working with primary source materials and other little bits and chunks of information and video. So I hope that we, we're going to see some really creative and innovative resources. And I, I know that um, you know we have consulted on the development of some seven, eight resources. So although I don't know who's going to be coming out with them first, I know there, the publishers, there will be new resources this year. Sorry, I should just say and at the secondary level, um, we've worked very closely with one publisher in particular that is doing that combination, that tool, kind of a toolkit effect of putting together leveled, age-appropriate um, sources uh, with varying reading levels and from multiple perspectives on particular historical events. And that's definitely coming out at the secondary level, and that's Oxford University Press. Oh, great. And I've just received a comment from Greg Harris who says, the thinking posters were really well received by those attending at Arctic High Bluff Arctic Bluffs PS in Barrie. Oh, that's great. Yeah. This, uh, this next, um, well, with the remaining of our fiscal year, we uh, want to get going on another set of them, and um, we're going to try to pick images that are maybe more accessible for kids in younger grades. Wonderful. So some sort of cartoony, illustrative sort of approach to the images. So thank you for that feedback. Great. Uh, okay, so those are our questions, and we are over time here, so we're going to close out. And again, if you do need to ask more questions, Jill is available at you by email. Here's our contact information for Jill Collier, National Coordinator of the Historical Thinking Project, and our presenter today. You can reach her jillcollier at rogers.com, and her this contact information will be sent to you with your email. And also you can get in touch with Byron Stevenson, who helped us plan this webinar at the Ontario Elementary Social Studies Teachers Association, or OESTA, and they're on Twitter at, at OESTA1. Uh, and you can also get in touch with us here at the OHS, myself, Alison Little, and Andrea Itzo, our communications coordinator, for anything to do with the resources we've shown today, the webinar, and uh, the resources we have here at the Ontario Historical Society. So I wanted to say thank you to Jill, Byron, and Andrea for their help getting this all together today.
It's been wonderful to work with you guys, and we had really great attendance. We had over 140 people here. Um, remember, we will be sending a survey to you with your uh, resources, so please fill this out. It helps us make the webinars better and more refined to what you need. So we really appreciate if you click the link and fill out our SurveyMonkey survey. So uh, the next webinar in our series, as I mentioned, will be in December, online outreach and strategy, but watch for other historical educator webinars in the future. So thank you, Jill, very much. That was great. Thank you very much. And best of luck thank everyone with the school year. Thank you, everyone. Have a great school year and go home. Time for dinner. <laughs> thank you for staying with us for a little bit later than expected.